Uh, good afternoon, brothers and sisters, and uh, we're uh, going to discuss the, our uh, lesson six in our quarterly. Uh, but before we start, let's uh, pray. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for this Sabbath day. We are so thankful that you provided us all the things that we need to know to learn more about you, to study you, and uh, to walk with you by providing us all the lessons and the uh, resources and materials that we need to understand and study. And as we go through this study, let the Holy Spirit uh, guide us, uh, lead us, and uh, help us to really send a clear message about the things that you want us to do, that we may be able to walk with you, abide with you in everything that we do in every day that we live in this world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, we are now on a Lesson uh, six, lesson four was talking about uh, Jesus, our uh, brother. Uh, the lesson that we had today was uh, Jesus, uh, uh, the rest giver. And so now our topic is Jesus, the faithful priest. Let's, um, our memory text is found in uh, Hebrews 7.26, New King James Version. It says, for such a high priest was fitting for us who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and has become higher than the heavens. So uh, what do we understand by um, word priest? So let's kind of uh, define priest as in its, uh, its basic uh, meaning. A priest is a person that mediates between God and man. So the Latin word for priest is pontifex. It means a bridge maker. So it focuses on the priest function as a bridge to divide between the bridge to divide between the human and the divine realms. The Greek words, and then that's the um, the Latin words, but the Greek word for priest is actually herius or herus is like a hero, which means mighty or holy. So it focuses mainly on its main characteristic of the priest, which is his holiness. So the Latin word focuses on the function, which is a bridge, the, uh, the divide be bridge, uh, the divide uh, between human and divine. And then the uh, Greek word is um, focuses on its characteristic as a holy uh, person. So the most important. Uh, uh, thing for the priest is he has the ability to have access to both parties and represent them well. So he should be um, very familiar with the one that he represents and the one that actually uh, uh, trying to get the presentation. So, so a successful priest then must be able to faithfully represent the people he said, to whom or she belongs and have true access to God and to accurately represent his instruction and will, meaning the God. Okay. So our presentation today will uh, be consistent of uh, consisted consists of two main uh, topic. Number one is the priest as representative of the people, and the priest as representative of God. As a representative of the people, we're going to discuss the uh, priest according to the order of Melchizedek an effective priest and some of the failure of the priest. As representative of God, we'll discuss about an eternal priest and the ultimate and sinless priest. Uh, I would like to, uh, my resources that I got all this information come from our adult teacher Sabbath School Bible Study Guide, from Ellen G. White Notes for the Sabbath School Lesson, companion book by Felix, Felix H. Cortez, which is an associate professor of New Testament literature in Andrews University, Exploring Hebrews, a, devotion, a devotional commentary by George R. Knight, the New King James, uh, uh, the New King James Andrews Study Bible, the NIB Life Application Study Bible, and the New King James uh, Verse uh, Remnant Study Bible with the uh, Ellen G. White comment. So all of these studies that I'm going to discuss came from all these resources. So in the Old Testament, the priests were called Levitical, Levitical priesthood. So the basic purpose of Levitical priesthood was 
to mediate between the sinful people, we are all sinful, at that time during this, uh, the, the people of Israel and God. Now, the priests at that time were appointed by God itself, not, not people, not the, one, not, not the leader, but God appointed them. So uh, they were appointed in order to minister in behalf of human beings. Therefore, those priests need to be merciful and understanding of human weaknesses. So, now, the priests and Levites could, okay, this is, this is a part of the ceremonial, ceremonial law that Moses has written. So, priests and Levites could only be members of the tribe of Levi. So, not only was a priest from the tribe of Levi, but he was also a descend, he must also be a descendant of Aaron. Aaron was a high priest. So not all Levites, the, other, the others cannot be priests, only had a descendant of Levi. Now, Aaron was in charge of all the priests and the Levites. Okay? He performed the daily sacrifices, maintained the tabernacle, and counseled the people on how to follow God. Okay? Now, the high priest somehow embodied God's ideal for the nation in his person. So that high priest kind of... Uh, uh, is looked upon by the Israel as the uh, embodiment of God. Okay, so they, they wear some special clothing, which symbolizes this. So the white linen material and the detailed embroidery of what they were wearing represented the purity and beauty of character that God expected from his minister and his people. Like if you are going to a court, your attorney, they always kind of wearing a tie, or they're wearing the a nice suit, so that uh, at least uh, they represent, so that, that the way they, they kind of, they were, uh, it, it's kind of perplex that person, that uh, the, the judges, of course, uh, uh, will kind of think of him as a respectable and re reliable person and properly representing, of course, the uh, lawyer's client. The same thing as when we go to the um, White House, you are not going there in your pajamas. Of course, you're going to wear the best suits that you have because you want to represent yourself and others that you represent before the, uh, before the president. And so how you present yourself reflects the people that you represent. And so that's very important. Okay, aside from those uh, very detailed embroidery that the high priest has to wear, they're also wearing this breastplate of judgment. This breastplate contains 12 jewels, and in each of those jewels engraved the name of one of the tribes of Israel, which is number 12. But in addition to those uh, uh, jewels, there, the breastplate of judgment also contains what we call the Urim and Tumim stones. These stones are the one that's being used by Israel to, uh, but through God, answers specific questions when asked by his people. We will learn that actually the priest also serves as a judge, and so how they make decisions actually they wear these stones, and when there's a, a questionable kind of uh, issue, they usually ask the, uh, these uh, stones, and actually God answers them. So the purpose of the plate was that High priest, whenever he gets, uh, bear the names of the sons of Israel in the breast, uh, and the breast piece of a judgment on his heart. So whenever he goes to the holy place, it kind of brings them to regular remembrance before the Lord. So the, the breastplate, actually, whenever you see it, it serves as a visual and symbolic identification of this high priest. But, and the high priest as being representative of the people. And then the comment here further is that the beauty and splendor of the priestly attire express the lofty plans of God for his people. So because Israel was God's treasure possession, the Israel is supposed to be a kingdom of priests and holy nation. Of course, that was in the Old Testament. At present, we are the one who are in Christ. We are studying the word of God. We are the one actually who is supposed to represent all this, all this realm. So, Actually, God wants us to be 
a kingdom of priests and holy nation. That is may, one of the main reasons that we are studying the word of God, so that we will understand it and we can relate to those people who still do not understand who God is. Okay. Now, there's another very important uh, function of the priest. He said, the priest presented, of course, whenever, whenever you seen, of course, you presented the gifts and the sacrifices, okay? So they, they, they brought it to the, in the sanctuary. The Israelites themselves could not approach God in the sanctuary. Only the priest can get into there. So that's why they bring the offering at the, uh, uh, outside the, the sanctuary. Uh, at the, before you get to the holy place and the most holy place. The priest also represented Israel in a more critical way than just giving this, uh, uh, bringing the sacrifices. In what way? So, whenever the, uh, whoever, imagine there's probably about uh, 3 million to 5 million people and every day they, whoever sin, they will have to bring the sacrifices and the offering. Uh, just imagine, that probably thousands of them gets into the uh, sanctuary every day. So, now, when an Israelite bring a sacrifice to, to expiate for his or sin, actually the priests are part of the sacrifice. Okay? You, we need to understand the priests are part of the sacrifice that he may bear the inequity of the congregation. Now, what does that mean? What, what do you mean by bear inequity? It means that actually it's a liability to punishment. Because when you sin, you are li liable for punishment by God. Or when he, or, but when, when we, you sin, you're, you're supposed to get the punishment. But if you repent, bring a sacrifice or, for expiation of sin, offering, that liability, when you do that, for that punishment was transferred to the priest himself. Okay? So when you bring that uh, sacrifice, actually your sin is being kind of transferred to the priest so that actually he will, he will assume it. He said he will assume it, the punishment. Of course, of course, he said, priests could not suffer the punishment for all the sins of Israel. Of course, that's understood. But he was a type of Jesus. So during the old time, what they were doing in the sanctuary was actually pointing to what God is going to do eventually into the cross. He was a type of Jesus, which is our true priest, representative of Israel, who would come and bear our sins on the cross. But in Hebrew 5, 5.10, Paul shows that Aside from the priest, from Aaron's uh, uh, geneo uh, what is this, genealogy, Jesus perfectly fulfills the priest's purposes. He said, God appointed him and Jesus understand as because he also suffered. So what is the difference between uh, Aaron and uh, Jesus being the priest now? First, Jesus was not chosen from among men. Aaron was chosen from among the Levi tribes. Okay? Then Jesus also appointed, adopted human nature in order, among other things, to serve as a priest in our behalf. So Jesus, we know that Jesus is fully God. He is also 100% human. That's why, that's why he's called the son of man. We will emphasize that later on. So uh, Jesus actually did not offer sacrifices for his own sin because he was sinless as a God. And as a human, he was still sinless. But only, he sacrificed, but only for our sin because he was sinless. He said, he prayed. He prayed to him who was able to save him from death and was heard. Hebrews was referring to the second death uh, when, uh, when, uh, when um, God actually uh, uh, resurrected him from the dead. From which God saved Jesus when he resurrected him. So Jesus learned obedience through, through what he suffered as a human, as a human, as a God. So obedience was new to Jesus, not because he was disobedient, but because he was God. So because Jesus is sovereign over the universe, and so he's the sovereign over the universe, he, just, Jesus, he did not obey anyone, and actually, instead, everyone actually obeyed him. Now, Jesus' suffering and death on the cross are 
really essential part of his priestly ministry. I don't know if anybody has a very good idea on how to die on the cross. That's very excruciating death. It's the most uh, painful death that you can have. And Jesus as human actually went through all these things. He suffered. But this is that he says, suffering did not perfect Jesus, did, did not make, did not perfect Jesus in the sense that he improved morally or ethically. Suffering also did not make him merciful. On the contrary, actually, Jesus came to this earth because he was always merciful. And that's why he had compassion on us. As a son of man, as a 100% human, Jesus, through suffering, showed that the reality of Jesus' brotherly love. This is the, this is the, the most uh, significant evidence, actually, of the authenticity of his human nature. When I was studying the Bible, I thought that, well, it, was, it will be nothing for Jesus, even if he was put on the cross, even if he died, because he is also God. And I thought that, hey, God, you, can, uh, you don't have to feel that because you are God. But what he's trying to present here is actually Jesus was 100% human. So whatever, whatever the human felt during all those death in the cross and all those flogging, he felt them all. He suffered from all those things. And so actually that through sufferings that the reality of Jesus' brotherly love the authenticity of his human nature and the depth of his submission, his submission as a representative of humanity to the will of Father were truly expressed and revealed. This is the evidence. So he was perfected in the sense that his suffering qualified him to be our priest. It was his life of perfect obedience. Jesus was human because he was born of... Uh, uh, of Mary, but he did not, he was capable, but he did not have a tendency to sin. That's why he became sinless. That's, he's our kind of uh, example on how we can actually uh, follow the, um, the Ten Commandments. But of course, after uh, we know and by experience that we cannot do it by ourselves, we need his help, we need his uh, gu guidance. So it was his. Life of perfect obedience and this death on the cross that constitute the sacrificial offering that Jesus presented before the Father as our priest. So he is the perfect priest. Aaron and all those Levites, they were just persons. They die and then someone else replaced them. So in a part of the ceremonial law that uh, Moses uh, wrote, in the scriptures, says, a person's genealogy was everything when it came to the priestly office. Their character and ability had nothing to do with the Levitical priest. The essential criterion was one's genealogy. So if you don't have the proper pedigree, you couldn't be a priest, no matter what other qualifications a person might be. So the law of Moses states that only the descendants of Levi could be priests. But the problem is Jesus belonged to the tribe of Judah. He did not belong to the tribe of the Levites. So with those facts in mind, and how, can, how can Jesus be a priest if he is not part of the Levi? But then he said, with those facts in mind, the author of Hebrews is trying to explain why uh, Jesus became a, is also a perfect uh, priest for, for us. He said, had two courts before him. First, he could have dismissed the uh, old the. Uh, Testament stipulation, or he could just forget it. Okay, uh, we just uh, create a new. Or he could search the Old Testament for a precedent for a non Levitical priesthood. So there must be something that a priest uh, can be a priest without being part of the uh, tribe of the Levi. And so he went to Psalm 1104. He turned to the later option, finding justification in Psalm 1.1.10.4. In 1.1.10.1, which is a will I read, says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. And then number four, The Lord has sworn and will not relent. 
you are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. So uh, Hebrews repeatedly sees Christ as the exalted figure in Psalm 1101. Uh, and then verse 4 refers to the same kind of figure when God swearing as you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So Hebrews bring the two verses together, arguing that if the royal figure in Psalm 1.1.10.1 is exalted Christ, then verse 4 must refer to the exalted Christ as well. So the, he, he was just uh, the psalm, which is David, was talking just the same person. So let's, uh, who is Melchizedek anyway? So who was Melchizedek and how did he prefigure Jesus? Uh, there isn't that much kind of mention about Melchizedek in the Bible, in the biblical scene. And from the silence of the uh, Old Testament on certain points about Melchizedek, we know that he doesn't have any father, doesn't have any mother, there's no genealogy, no beginning, and no ending. But from Genesis 14, 18, 20, and Hebrews 7, 1, 2, we, have some, we know that uh, some, uh, certain facts that Melchizedek was the king of, king, king of Salem, meaning that's a king of peace. He was a priest of God. He blessed Abraham, and he received tithes from Abraham. That's all that we know about Melchizedek. So that means from what we know, we know that Melchizedek is greater than Abraham because Abraham paid tithe to him. And then Melchizedek also blessed Abraham. So, and the Levi, the Levi paid tithe to Melchizedek through Abraham. Therefore, said Melchizedek is greater than Levi. Consequently, Melchizedekian priesthood is greater than Levitical. So, we're just trying to justify where uh, the what kind of uh, criteria Jesus. Uh, create to, for him to be the priest for the Israelites. Okay. So Jesus, here's, here's what's an alternative uh, Old Testament priesthood. It was that alternative priesthood that provided the model for Christ's non-Levitical priesthood. Although he was not part of the he was not part of the Levi tribe, he was still actually uh, uh, a priest he can be a priest through this uh, Levitical uh, priesthood. He said Melchizedek, even though he wasn't a Levite, was still a priest. Okay? So the Hebrews present him as forerunner of Christ's heavenly priesthood. So Melchizedek was a forerunner. Okay? So it says that Jesus was not unqualified. He was qualified for the priesthood. And actually he had a genuine priesthood that actually would last forever. We're, we're going to discuss that later on. So it is absolutely essential to see why the author brings in Melchizedek, because there's nothing in the you know uh, in the in the Bible that is not uh, kind of, we have to know the reason why it it just doesn't write it there. It usually gives you the answer. He said it was not to fuel ongoing speculation because there was a lot of speculation about the mer mer mysterious pers uh, personage of uh, Melchizedek, but rather just to establish a historical justification. So he's justified now for the non-Levitical heavenly ministry of Jesus. Because according to the ceremonial law, you cannot, you cannot be a priest if you're not a Levite. But now there is another way that we can actually justify for Jesus being the priest and non-Levitical genealogy. Now in Hebrews 7, 11 to 19, I'm just going to read the, more, the important one. that. It says, now if perfection had been through the Levitical priesthood, the old priesthood, for under, for under it the people received the law, what further need was there for another priest? If they were effective, the Levitical priesthood, we don't need another priest, okay, to arise after the order of Melchizedek rather than after the order of Aaron. It says, for when there's a, now, when there's a change in the priesthood, when there's a change in the ceremonial law, there is a necessity of change in the law also. Remember, this is not, we're not talking about the moral law. We're talking about the ceremonial law. Okay? 
For on one hand, there is a setting aside of the former requirements, the requirements to be a, a Levite, uh, belong to the Levite, because of its weakness and unprofitableness. It's not very effective. For the law perfected nothing. The law is just for us to know that we are sinful, just to tell us that we are sinful, the, sin that, the thing that we do. I said, on the other hand, there is the bringing in of a better hope through which we draw near to God. What is this hope? Okay. Verse 11, 18, 19 tells us that the regulation related to the Levitical priesthood was what? Weak, unprofitable, and perfected nothing. So the second idea also begins and ends the passage, that of an alternative way of accomplishing God's purpose outside of the Levitical priesthood. So that alternative priesthood and better way are directly tied to Christ's priestly ministry after the order of Melchizedek. Throughout the passage, the argument is that Christ as high priest could accomplish what the Levitical priesthood could never hope of achieving. Did you believe that? Christ as high priest could accomplish what the Levitical priesthood, what the old Levitical priesthood could never hope of achieving. That is hope of being crowned with glory and honor. Of entering God's promised rest, which we discussed in today's lesson, inheriting the blessings that he promised to Abraham. And those promises had obviously now, uh, now, the one that uh, actually uh, Hebrews was uh, written to those Christians that were being persecuted at that time to give them, actually to encourage them to continue their faith even though they were being persecuted. So those promises had obviously not been fulfilled in the lives of the recipient of the letter of the Hebrews. In fact, actually, they, uh, they were experiencing the very opposite reproach, abuse, dispossession, and imprisonment. But on the other hand, each of those promises had already been fulfilled in Jesus. So they could not, the only hope that they can have is what uh, Jesus already accomplished through the cross. So Jesus Christ is the, the, the effective priest. He's, he represented continually. Right now, at present, where is Jesus? He's in the sanctuary. The most holy place, right? Jesus Christ represented as continually standing at the altar, momentarily offering up the sacrifice for the sins of the world. Now, he is a minister of the true tabernacle, which the Lord fits and not a man. So he is talking about the heavenly sanctuary, not the earthly sanctuary. It says, a daily and yearly typical atonement is no longer to be made, which was done in the earthly sanctuary. But the atoning sacrifice through a mediator is essential. Why? Because of the constant commission of sin. Every day we sin, even though we don't know it, we don't intend to it, but because of our nature, because of our sinfulness, we make those sins. But Jesus is there. He's officiating in the presence of God, offering up his shed blood that he sacrifices when he was, as had been a lamb slain. So, we had been already forgiven through the uh, Jesus uh, Christ uh, shed blood. Uh, what we need to do, we need to open up. We need to accept that grace. By accepting that grace, we need to submit our will to God. Just as an evidence that we really and truly accepted the grace. It's not just when you accept the grace, then you're okay. You can do whatever you want. It doesn't work that way. You have to show the evidence that you accepted the grace. It's free for everyone. But then when you accept it, you have to show that you accepted it. During that time also, there was, uh, we, have, we have to uh, discuss about the failure of the priesthood. They never completely fulfilled God's promises for them. There was this high and low priesthood in Israel's history and were factors in the reflection of the, uh, the spiritual condition of the people because the people will look, uh, look out after them. Like the, the good example are the chi first children of uh, Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, the children of the first high priest. They perished because they offered an authorized fire before the Lord. They were not authorized. Okay? Then centuries later on, 
the inequity, negligence of the priest that follows led to the fall of Israel and Judah. So these priests simply have not been derelict in their duty to teach the law. They're supposed to teach the law. We will discuss that later on. But they led immoral lives and misled the people. Just like uh, I listen to you and uh, you are a good speaker. You can, uh, you can convince me when you talk, but then I have to see how you live. And this is what happened. They led immortal, immoral lives and misled the people. Then after the exile, their ministry did not improve either when they were exiled by the Babylonians. So its streets is Nadir, the highest peak in the time of Jesus, which is one of the factors that led to the fall of Jerusalem in AD 70 when uh, <clears throat> the temple was completely, uh, uh, was completely uh, taken down. So the office of the priesthood during that time was controlled by the Romans and they sold it to the highest bidder. We are so familiar with the work of the government and others just like right now in the, with the COVID thing and when you have to go home, you have to, uh, the people that actually owns these uh, motels, they are taking advantage of these things. And the same thing with this uh, priesthood, they were in control so they were kind of, they sold it to the highest bidder. They forgot the main purpose, the main reason why they're supposed to be priests. So we come to the second topic now, the priest as representative of the God. So we were talking about the priest as representative of people. Now we're going to talk about us, the priest being the representative of God. So let's talk about in general of the priest being representative before people, uh, of God. So the priest also represented God before the people, okay? This is crucial function, and the duties of the priest as representative can be, we can organize it into five categories. First, priests were agent for God. What do they mean by that? So they protected the sacred things, and they sac the sacred space from encroachment by non-Levites, okay? They also purified and consecrated objects and persons so that they can be used for holy purpose when you're doing service for God. Second, they, they were teachers of the law. What do they mean by that? They explained to the people the rules and meaning of the cult, the story of God's care for Israel and his grace. Third, priests also had an important function of interpreting and applying God's law and principles to specific situations. We all know that if you buy, a, if you look for a Bible now, we see all kinds of Bible, different kinds of Bibles. And sometimes with those uh, different Bibles, actually, there are some authors who actually intentionally replace some other things so that actually they can confuse those who's going to read it. But uh, <clears throat> during that time, there were only the Pentateuch, the five books were only the one that are actually well known, uh, Bible for the people. And so the priests were the one that interpreting these uh, principles to a specific situations. So they were to make God's abstract principles and rules into concrete and understandable action and practice. Meaning you look at the theor theory and then the priest will explain it in the practical thing that they're supposed to do. Number four, priests were also judges. So they assisted the judge of every town in difficult matters and the high priest functioned as the nation's chief justice, <coughs> just like the Supreme Court. So number five, this is, a, this is very interesting. <laughs> Priests were spokesmen for God. What does that mean? Their role was to put the name of God upon Israel so that God would bless them. Okay. So this implies a great privilege and great power because you're the one who can't wait to... You know, imagine somebody, this guy, can talk to God. Huh? This implies a great privilege and great power. This is what God's envisioned his people as a nation would do for all the world. So they also, well, then we back to, they also carried the Urim and Tumim. These are two stones to which God revealed this will regarding specific questions asked by the people. When there are some issues that are really, really hard to kind of judge, and there's a lot of that, they will consult these stones. When other one says, okay, the, the Urim, I don't know if the, that's a negative and the other one is positive. So whichever kind of light, 
as though it's the answer of God. So God will also say uh, either, uh, either negative or positive. Okay? That's very interesting. So it's like uh, God being the, 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 the judge. Uh, we, we now have uh, numbers of people as being uh, sitting on the judge kind of thing. And at that time, they have this Urim and Tumim. So, Hebrews 7, 16, 17 read, Who has not become a priest on the basis of the power of the law, physical requirement, meaning talking about Jesus, but on the basis of the power of an indestructible life? For it is witness of him, you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So, Jesus received the priesthood on the basis of what? Of an indestructible life. And because he holds an eternal ministry. So what does it mean? Jesus' ministry will never be surpassed or outclassed. It will never be replaced anymore. Jesus saves completely, eternally, to the uttermost. Okay? The salvation that Jesus provides is total and final. Okay? So it reaches the innermost aspects of human nature. So that is the last one. There is no. There will be no more priest, except uh, Jesus. Okay. We're going. We're getting now to the last one. Jesus as the ultimate and sinless priest. In Hebrews seven twenty six twenty eight says, "For it was indeed fitting that we should have such a high priest." Now it's Jesus, that is holy, innocent, undefiled, separated from sinners and exalted above the heavens, who has no need like other priests, because the, uh, Aaron and the other priests, to, uh, they were sacrificing daily, first of all, for, his, for their own sin and then for the sins of the people. Since he did not, he did that once for, but then Jesus did all of this for his own sins and then for, okay, I'm sorry. The Levite priests actually uh, they did this for their own sins and then for the sins of the people. Since he did not once for all when he offered himself. For the law, it says, for the law appoints men having weaknesses as high priests. But the word of the oath, okay, which came after the law appoints a son who has been made perfect forever. What does it mean? It defines Jesus as the ultimate priest. Okay? The one no other can equal. Uh, Orton Wiley commenting on these verses uh, and kind of uh, explaining these verses that I read points out that the high priest which become us or is suitable for our needs must have a tripled perfection. Number one, he should be perfection of character. Number two, perfection of his offering and the perfection of intercession. You remember when you can, remember in the Old Testament when they have to offer a sacrifice it should not be without blemish. It should be very clean. But because that was actually the uh, pointing toward the perfect offering and, sacri and sacrifice of uh, Jesus Christ. So Hebrews 7.26 cites five aspects of Christ's perfect character. So now we're talking about the perfect character of Jesus. Number one, he is holy. We already mentioned that uh, on the first part of the lesson. So Haggaius means belonging to God or having been set apart for him. But Haggaius... Through translated in English is also as holy. Uh, then Jesus wasn't merely someone belonging to God, such as the average Christian, but so he is holy in character. He is characterized by the goodness which is pure in God's sight. So he did not have any tendency to sin, just like any human. Number, number two, he is innocent or harmless. Now, in Greek word, akakos, kakos is the word for evil, kakos, evil. But when you prefix the letter A to Greek word, the word takes on the opposite meaning. That's why akakos meaning free from evil or innocent. So this is scripture uses the word to describe someone intrinsically good who has no evil at all. He doesn't have any tendency to be evil. Normal human being, as soon as you are born, you have a tendency to be evil. We, they don't have to teach that, that, that thing to us. We already know it by our nature. 
Number three, he is undefiled. What does that mean? The Greek word for undefiled is amiantos. It means one without blemish or defilement. So that thought takes us back to the Old Testament. We discover that the offering, as I said, had to be free from blemish. A Levite with physical deformities could not even become a priest. If you have some kind of deformity, you cannot become a priest, even, the, even if you actually belong to the lineage of Aaron. Number four, he was separated from sinners, meaning Christ is morally different from sinners. His exaltation has permanently, his exaltation has permanently separated him from them. Actually, uh, number five, he has been exalted above the heavens because he is the creator of heaven and earth and the universe. He exalted above the heavens. That phrase is parallel to Hebrew 4.14 in which we read that we have a great high priest who passed through heavens. So this qualification is anchored in the fact that when the, the, uh, the empty tomb where Jesus was uh, laid down, that stands at the very basis of the gospel. Now, Jesus not only died for us, but he was resurrected and, ascend, and has ascended into heaven where he currently saved as a high priest in the heavenly sanctuary. So Jesus, our ultimate and sinless, sinless person, Christ represented his father to the world. He represents before God the chosen ones in whom he has restored the moral image of God. That means us. They are his heritage. We are his heritage. No priest, no religionist can reveal the father to any son or daughter of Adam. Men have only one advocate. We only have one advocate. We don't have any different advocate. We don't have any different pathway to God. Only Jesus. One intercessor who is able to pardon transgression. Ellen G. White Father says it. Shall not our hearts swell with gratitude to him who gave Jesus to be the propitiation for our sins? <clears throat> Think deeply. Sir. Think deeply upon the love that Father has manifested in our behalf. The love that he has expressed for us. And then he said, we cannot measure this love. No words can express the, the, how, how, how big this one is. Measurement, there is none, he said. We can only point to Calvary, the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. It is an infinite sacrifice. Can we comprehend and measure infinity? Of course not. The last slide is about uh, Ellen G. White, Testimonies to the Church. He said, Christ is the connecting link, our connecting link between God and man. He has promised his personal intercession, and we can always rely on God's promise. We know that. He places the whole virtue of his righteousness, so we, his righteousness, on the side of suppliant. So he gave us his righteousness. He gave us his faith. So actually, we're not depending on our faith because our faith can actually go up and down. But we rely basically on the faith of Jesus Christ, on his righteousness. So as we approach God through the virtue of the Redeemer's merit, not our merit, but Jesus' merit, okay? Christ places us close by his side, encircling us with his human arm while his divine arm grasps the throne of the infant. So he was our intercessor. And he promises to hear and answer our supplication. This is the Testimonies for the Church, Volume 8, from Ellen G. White. Okay, um, let's uh, pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for this lesson. We just uh, uh, pray and uh, ask you that uh, for those who are going to uh, see this uh, presentation and the lesson, May the Holy Spirit guide them and help them to understand the lesson that is appropriate for our present time and that we may be able to continue to abide in you and submit our will completely in you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.